Welcome to Real Herbalism Radio, show 228, recorded live at Big Dog Studios. This show is brought to you by... (sighs) Oh, I tell you, after drinking some of that dream herbal tea from Sacred Blossom Farms, I am ready to head to sleep for the evening. You're going to be dreaming about biodynamic farming and the best herbs all night long. For sure. Hey, if you want to get a good night's sleep, a little bit of a discount... Go, go to uh, sacred awesome, sacredblossomfarms.com and use the coupon code REALHERB, all caps, 15. Many of us are inspired to study plant medicines by our elders. The path of plants is often challenging and filled with opportunities. Today we're talking with Alexis Chesney, doctor of naturopathic medicine and author of Preventing Lyme and Other Tick-Borne Diseases, about finding the healing intersections in the natural world. Now here are your hosts. I'm Candace Hunter. I'm Patrick Hunter. And, and welcome, welcome to, to Real Herbalism, Herbalism Radio. Radio. Welcome, Alexis. I'm happy to see you here today. Hi, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. It's great. You know, it's funny. You're one of the very first folks we've had who's absolutely comfortable with Zoom, but probably (laughs) wouldn't have been just a few short months ago. (laughs) You are right. It's got to be really strange. A lot of Zoom and uh, Doxy.me is what we use for our telemedicine. So yeah, (laughs) I've got to believe (laughs) that's that's got to be really weird to be like using the telemedicine to be like not in the same room with the person you're talking with. Yeah, it is. It is, and you know, just like almost everything nowadays, I feel like we're coming to these new normals. So yeah. I'm doing this for six weeks probably now. Um, Unfortunately, it feels sort of normal, but hopefully this will not stay this way forever. (laughs) Right. Yeah, hopefully we won't get too comfortable with this uh, not talking in person to everybody. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, you you can certainly miss a lot. Well, for you, medicine started off very hands-on, didn't it? Uh, With my family growing up, I had... um, a grandmother I was very close to um, who had rheumatic fever as a child. And uh, at that time, they didn't have penicillin yet. Yeah. Um, they didn't have something that would treat, you know, conventionally speaking, um, this strep bacteria that causes rheumatic fever. And so she had uh, trouble with her heart and other consequences that she lived with for the rest of her life since childhood. Um, I'm so blessed and, and grateful that she was there. And um, we had time together until I was 18 years old, which was wonderful. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, I was, I was there a lot with her at hospitals and, um, you know, she was pretty homebound. So, yeah. um, I spent a lot of time with her and kind of in that, um, field of medicine. Um, uh, my aunt was a nurse. And so there's a lot of medical talk going on, yeah. you know, in medications, <laughs> and what's going on next and what kind of testing has to happen. So, yeah, it was sort of, um, bred into me early on and I was very interested in it as well so yeah it makes a big difference when your family culture really revolves around medicine it's it's like growing up in a really different than many other people whose families don't have to experience that level of illness and care you know especially with elders um that that must have made I would think a big impression on you was that part of how you got your interest in becoming a doctor I think so. Yeah, I think it was foundational to, um, you know, what I thought I was going to be going into a career in um, regular medicine. You know, Mm -hmm. I thought I would become an MD, medical doctor. Um, But then slowly over time, um, you know, I became more and more interested in natural health. Um, So so what did when you were like starting out, what did you expect medical it would be like to be a medical doctor? Like what were you what was your expectation and how did it change as you shifted through your as you like progressed? Well, I really loved helping people. So I started off as a candy striper in the hospital that my grandmother was in all the time that my nurse worked at. I mean, my aunt worked at as a nurse. And then later, actually, after college, I went back and became what was called the nurse extender, like a medical assistant, basically, right after um, college at the time. So I had a lot of uh, connections to this hospital. And uh, it was like a second home in some ways, you know, when I was there with my grandma. Um, But, um, you know, I really, I was really interested in the caring piece, I think. And so nursing was also um, of interest. And and I looked into that, like becoming a nurse practitioner um, or becoming a a medical doctor, osteopathic 
doctor, you know, there's so many, you know, this yeah. field is, is wonderful. There are so many options, uh, especially more and more over time. Um, but I think a lot of it was just seeing that chronic illness and really wanting to be there with the patient and, um, you know, help them through that process. So I see how that kind of translates into what I do now because I mostly work with chronically ill patients. Um, of course, mostly Lyme disease and tick-borne disease, but also in other ways. Um, so I think that's kind of traveled through. How did you years. end up making the step from like traditional, I'm saying traditional doctor, but you know, from like medical to naturopathic, which is obviously also medical, but how did, how did you find it? How did you? Yeah, I was going to say, what, was there a specific event or something that you experienced and went like that epiphany moment? Yeah, I think slowly, slowly, um, over time, I, I remember I was working at the hospital after college. I was pre-med um, in college, graduated, um, didn't take the MCAT, that horrible test, you know, you need to take mm. the standardized test to yeah. apply to medical school. I decided to wait until after college. So I would work um, and study and do that test, right? So that was the plan. And then I would go to medical school. Um, but so as I was doing that, I was also reading a lot of um, uh, like Andrew Weil, um, you know, books that basically were talking about natural healing. And I would, I remember like walking through the halls of the hospital and thinking about, well, why can't we do, you know, vitamin C IVs? You know, I'm taking care of people's IVs yeah. <laughs> and taking their blood. <laughs> this is just all around me all the time. And, and then, well, why can't we use, you know, some supplements or what about this herb or, you know, what about this vitamin or mineral? And it was just not really a part of that world. And I just began to question that yeah. and um, certainly know and saw the value of allopathic medicine, conventional medicine, but also was really curious about like what else there was and more so about, you know, prevention. And well, how did all these people get here? Because it was actually a heart hospital, right? Because yeah. my grandmother's yeah. experience. But what I was seeing was a lot of people coming in with heart attacks and getting stents placed. You know, and, and so I was thinking a lot about diet, nutrition, exercise, lifestyle, yeah. okay. um, vitamins and minerals, you know, all these great things I was reading about thinking, well, why aren't we telling them about that? You know? <laughs> uh, maybe we could prevent these things. Um, so that got me going. And um, I, I really didn't know that there was something called naturopathic medicine. And then somebody told me, hey, there's this school up in Bridgeport, um, Connecticut, because I was in New York City living at the time. I grew up on Long Island. I was in New York City living after college. And I thought, huh, OK, I'll, I'll check it out. And I got their catalog and I saw their um, like the, the academic um, schedule. Right. And the first two years were basic science. I mean, I wanted that. I wanted that um, foundation of the basic sciences. And then the next two years after that was all the stuff I was really interested in. Nutrition, counseling, nice. hydrotherapy, uh, botanical medicine, um, pharmacology, of course, as well. And so I thought, wow, this is like the perfect curriculum <laughs> that I had no idea existed until, you know, after college. Um, so um, that, was, that was huge. Yeah, that was, that was exciting. And because otherwise, I was thinking of... Um, like Andrew at the time, this is like early, it's like 2000, early 2000s. Um, Andrew Weil has a, had a uh, fellowship. So mm -hmm. I thought, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to you know MD school and then I have to get into this fellowship, you know, but that's after residency, you know, after way after <laughs> you know, I had to wait all that time to get to really what I wanted to learn about. So it was funny, like thinking about that and then having this curriculum handed to me. Thinking, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that feels right. <laughs> yes. Yes, it sounds yeah. like you took the right path there. Yeah. Yeah. So who gave you that curriculum? How did that how did that connect to you? I mean, I sometimes for me someone will hand me something and I hadn't even thought of it. I'm like, "Oh my goodness, there it is." So was it someone close to you or just somebody uh, in the yeah, field? Yeah, it was my uncle actually. Yeah, other side of the family. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, right. he was um, definitely more into natural types of healing uh, and exposed me to some of those things as well, um, opposed to like that allopathic piece. Yeah. So when you got started and you you know, sign up, you're taking your introduction for, to naturopathy, you know, you're just getting started. Were you thinking, yes, and I'm going to cure the world of Lyme disease? 
<laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> that came later, definitely. Yeah. How so did I was, you... Wow, it was a lot. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. yeah. How did you find your path life, through so... all of that? Um, so I had a friend um, somewhere in school. It's a four-year medical school, right? And then um, I ended up moving up to Vermont for residency after that. Mm -hmm. So somewhere probably toward the end of those four years in Bridgeport, Connecticut, you know, right near the home of Lyme disease, right? Yeah. Lyme, Connecticut. Right, right. <laughs> Unfortunately, my friend got Lyme and um, we, we didn't know it at the time, but, um, you know, Bridgeport's beautiful in the way that it's right on the water. So I was really lucky that I could walk uh, to the water between classes and, mm -hmm. you know, because we'd have these packed days of classes and studying and yeah. we'd just walk back and forth. And um, on these little walks, she would just have all these weird pains. She'd have to stop. She'd have this shortness mm -hmm. of breath. She'd describe all these bizarre symptoms. And I was thinking, we were all thinking, you know, what could possibly be going on? And they would come and go. Right. So it was also a little odd, like, well, why today are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> and tomorrow you're not, like, what's going on? Um, so I actually brought her to um, the doctor. So I don't remember where, maybe New Haven, Connecticut, that diagnosed her with... Um, Lyme disease through a company called Igenex. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in clinic, I think we were in our clinical years at that point, we were seeing some Lyme disease and some of the doctors were a little more um, educated on, you know, in the way that I would become, you know, on the alternative ways to look at Lyme and testing and such, and that it's, it's not necessarily always cured with a three week course of doxy. Um, so they recommended that she see this one doctor who would do the Igenex testing, which is better um, more accurate antibodies testing for Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. So she got this blood work done and I brought her either, I think I brought her to the other, the appointment where they're actually reviewing it. And, and he said, yes, look, you know, it's positive. We're going to treat you. She got better. It, it was really interesting. Nice. Um, so thank goodness, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it, was, it was wonderful in that way. Um, but then also it, it got me thinking more uh, in the way of, um, you know, academically and medically thinking about, wow, this is, quite an interesting illness um, that can present in such a bizarre way and um, be difficult to diagnose and treat. So, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's one of the things that has been like scary about Lyme disease and many of the other tick-borne diseases is that they, they seem like they come, they go, you may not even realize you've gotten bitten by a tick and then, you know, now you've got these issues and they seem like they're, from like a Chinese medicine perspective, it all fits a pattern. But when you go to a doctor who's not literate in Lyme disease, they might say, well, this is really random. You know, maybe you've got a hormonal problem or are you allergic to wheat? You know, I mean, they'll come up with something that's not really a very helpful because it's the pattern is really disparate. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, all the time I see that in the patients I see, not one person. I mean, like anything, I mean, we're all individuals, but with Lyme, it really presents very differently from patient to patient, which makes it difficult to, um, to diagnose. Yeah. yeah. And you have, you have background in acupuncture as well, right? I do. Yes. I'm also an acupuncturist. I fell in love with that and I don't do it much, which I, I, I miss. And maybe at some point I'll do more of it. It's, it's just amazing. I love it. Um, at, at the University of Bridgeport, I added that on. So I was also, um, found that and yes. So, so has that has that helped you like see patterns differently, do you think? Because um, I know the way that Chinese medicine approaches things, it seems almost like it's like looking at at the the person, but from so far up that they're seeing this big pattern of the symptoms mm -hmm. instead of how even just being in it, you're like, oh, this hurts over here and that's happening over there. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 I think it, it's also just like all that I learned in school during that period of time, mm -hmm. you know, brought about this really wonderful gift of being able to look at the body holistically, you know, from all these different perspectives. Um, so I think, yeah, I don't even think about it. Like when, you know, my brain <laughs> kind of switches from one, um, you know, principle or um, theory to another, but it certainly does affect my everyday work. Yeah. Oh, I, was, I had something, but you went right over it. So it's okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I, it's I all get right. excited about hearing how the different pieces fit in. I mean, you know, it's, you've got 
doctor doctoral training, you know, through conventional style science and all of that. You've got the naturopathic, which does a really nice job of interweaving a lot of plant medicines. You've got acupuncture. Do you have other pieces there that inform your work? Um, well, I think, you know, I think a lot of what I'm realizing maybe in my late later <laughs> years of practice now um, is the intuition and the um, spiritual nature and how I think a lot of what Lyme disease presents for people is an opportunity for transformation, which is terrifying. Yeah. Sometimes. Oh, right. Yeah. So um, it, it's been really uh, amazing to be offered that chance to walk with people in a certain way and help them get all the resources, certainly not just me. I mean, people need many, many resources to get through some of these kinds of, it's not always like that, but when, <laughs> when Lyme or tick-borne disease or whichever other chronic diseases come about for people in order to really walk through that path and see them get to the other side mm -hmm. is, is amazing. It's so rewarding and um, an honor. Um, so I think I'm seeing things a little differently, you know, as time goes on, I've, I've been doing this just 10, 10 11 years, but um, it's been interesting to see that unfold over time. You know what I hate? I hate going and clicking on the search engine and entering terms in and finding all these big companies that own all the search terms. Fact is, you can get it there. You can get your company there in a different way. Mudpod Design can help you out. See them for SEO services at mudpoddesign.com. So does it mean that now you don't want to go into the woods anymore? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because I didn't come, moving up to Vermont was, um, you know, culturally very different for me. Yeah. And I was excited to be able to enjoy the outdoors. But, um, you know, I grew up in suburban, close to the city type living um, so we were on some land, of course, I would play outdoors. I love that. But it's very different than frolicking through these fields okay. of grass where the ticks are right. here or out on Long <laughs> Island where there's lime as well. So, um, yeah, I wasn't so used to that. So, you know, I, I love hiking and biking and um, being outside, but, you know, I stay like on the path. And for some reason, I don't know, maybe because of not living here um, for so long or that that that's okay with me, you know, right. like I'll go into the woods, I'll stay on the path. Um, I wear my permethrin treated socks and shoes. You know, I don't, you know, I have all these things I don't do, but <laughs> I still want to get out there and do things that I love to do and enjoy nature because it's so important. Um, but I don't feel like I need to roll around in the fields. <laughs> so, <laughs> being a kid would be harder here. Yes. <laughs> and we have to do, um, it was always, Tick checks. Yeah. So yeah. anytime, anytime you were outside during, especially during the spring and early summer in Minnesota, you'd come in and tick check, you know, everything. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know how many times that you'd, they'd find them, you'd find one and you'd have to take it off or it just, uh, yeah, <laughs> kind of I mean, yeah. the thing is like, you know, Minnesota's mosquitoes, but everyone forgets mm. about the other and the ticks, the ticks and yeah. they're just, oh. I remember being on the side of a freeway once. Um, we were, our car was stalled, and I looked down, and my shoes were covered with ticks. Oh. I mean, they were crawling everywhere. These are the stories that I, I know, and I'm just like, <laughs> oh my here. god! And I don't have any permethrin or whatever that is. I mean, yeah. who has that? You know? <laughs> right, right. Oh my no, god! No. So, well, the North Canada. Central states have really gotten hit over the last ten years. My goodness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And yeah. you know, the the deer tick when when that was the the big one uh people were talking about in the you know in the 90s and early 2000s and, and they were so tiny yeah. that you you couldn't I mean I never knew if I had one uh, there because they were course. so small. Yeah, they're so tiny. Yeah. You know, in comparison yeah. to the to, to well, I didn't realize that the common name was the dog tick. Cuz mm -hmm. I've that, I've yeah. pulled many of those yeah. from my body at, through the years mm -hmm. but but I'd never seen the, the deer tick. And I guess even if I did, it was so small. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's easy to miss. And that's part of the problem, certainly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then here in Oregon, there, I 
reading the book too is like, oh man, there's ticks here too. <laughs> <laughs> ticks everywhere. Yeah. Got the Western black legged tick, so right, which looks like the deer tick, which is just the black legged tick. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things I thought was kind of brilliant about your book was the really good detailed information, including like pictures and everything on identifying ticks, because it's something that, Thank you. you know, growing up, I was just like, ew, tick, gross, <laughs> ah. you know, you have a big fit and then you pull it out and you like squish it and get rid of it. And it's so disgusting. And it just yeah. never occurred to me then, although it makes really good sense to like actually put it, I love that, put it in a baggie. <laughs> You know, save it, figure out what it was. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's good information. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't, yeah. I didn't know there was, uh, and some of them have a, a three part life cycle. I had no yeah. idea. Yeah, you know, all the hard ticks do. Right. So they attach on to some animal, like a mouse, get mm -hmm. a disease or a pathogen, like you said, and then they go off and go on to another one. And oh, hey, by the way, we're going to swap some fluids here. And <laughs> You will. <laughs> yep, I know. Dog. Not pleasant to think about. No. Yeah. No, People no. call it nature's dirty needle. Uh, 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 I don't. I don't say that term too much. But yeah, I just, brought it to mind when you uh, described it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. We're done with this interview. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it was funny. When I told Patrick we were going to do this interview, I'm like, this book's really great. We're going to do this. He's like, um, are you sure? <laughs> you know, that's a little gross. <laughs> you know? But I think that was the whole point is after yeah. going into it, you really, I mean, a lot of detail on the little critters. Uh, <laughs> but then you have a whole section on, on the herbs and how to deal with a lot of those things, which I thought brought it right back around to what, you know, we try here as at Real Herbalism Radio and Practical Herbalism, you know, that practical herbalism, mm -hmm. which almost mm -hmm. seems like um, being in, in a nat in naturopath fits into that practical doctoring, if mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, we're big on education. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I want to, through this book, I really want to empower people to take care of themselves and to know, oh, okay, I got a tick bite. Well, what kind of tick is it? Do I need to worry about this? Maybe the tick isn't carrying any pathogens. Right. Uh, maybe I need to send it away and get it tested and find out which pathogens it's carrying. And then, okay, what am I going to do with that information? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I wrote the book because um, I kept my, my handout kept getting longer and longer <laughs> and longer. Because <laughs> we love to give out handouts. So it's, you know, there's the diet stuff. There's, you know, whatever, a handout about <laughs> anything. Um, and so I always had the prevention piece. So when people would come in, because usually I'm seeing people that are chronically ill, yeah. but I'll try and get to, okay, so, you know, what do you do around tick bite prevention? Because you can get it again, or you yeah. can get a different, a different disease from a new oh, tick God. bite, right? And people yeah. don't really think they're like, oh, I already have Lyme disease. Yeah, whatever, prevention. <laughs> like, no, really. <laughs> your family and friends. Like, yeah. I've got that response. It's very funny. Um, but then, so, so someone's like, well, write a book. And, you know, I kept coming up and I just said, I have to do this because there is a lot to say. And this handout is getting longer. It is. And, <laughs> and it was, I, it's know, really I good. I keep saying it over and over yeah. to people so now they can just like <laughs> read the book. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's funny too, because like I started reading it, and I'm like, at the first, I'm like, this is great, this is great, this is really sciency, this is this is really sciency. God, this is a little hard to like take this all in. And then I, I finished it, and I thought about, it. I sat with it for a day, and I thought, you know, that is brilliant that you did it that way because so many people that are struggling with Lyme and it's not yet diagnosed, or they live in an area where they don't have access to really Lyme literate physicians or medical professionals. They need this language. They need to really understand what is actually happening. They need the science so that they can speak the right language and find the people that will actually be able to help them. Even if you're talking to an herbalist, you need, as a, as a person struggling or dealing with Lyme, working on healing from Lyme, you need the scientific piece of that to talk to your herbalist to find out, for one thing, if your herbalist understands the science, and if they don't, that might not be the right herbalist for you. And secondly, if your herbalist is willing to go learn and get the science needed to make sure that, you know, the right herbs are being used and that you're going in the right direction, because it's, 
I mean, people with Lyme disease struggle with it for a really long time. Chronic illness is exhausting. Okay. And honestly, you need you need to have you need that language. So I really, after thinking about it, I was like, you know, I'm really glad you did it that way. I'm really, really yeah. glad you did it that way. Well, I appreciate that so much. Thank you. Okay, because you should yeah. just heard her. Like, I just, I just think this is too much science. <laughs> This is too much science. This is too much science. I, I don't know why we're even, I don't know what we're going to do. Let's skip over that stuff. You know, I want to make it accessible, but give a little bit more for those who want it or those who yes. need it or for the doctors out there or herbalists, you know. People. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it. I'm really glad you did it. I really am. And, you know, my thing with science isn't that I hate it. It's just that the words become really hard to pronounce. And the visual, <laughs> yes. and, and then you're visualizing like the spiral shape of this, this uh, um, bacteria or this, uh, yeah, bacteria. You know, it's, it's gross. I'm picturing it burrowing through, pe <laughs> and it just, it gets really visually challenging. <laughs> you know? yeah, I have this stuffed animal that a patient gave to me. That's a spirochete. So it's a stuffed animal like this. <laughs> And it's, it's a little, you know, spiral, yeah, spiral, and it's green, and it's, so I don't have it here, but it has, it's in my office, and, oh. um, you know, kids that I see will go over and, like, play with the spirochete, the stuffed animal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of course, this is what I have in my office. So. Well, if, if you're going to have something that makes it really cute, fur and stuffing <laughs> would do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, it doesn't have eyes, does it? It does. Oh, oh no. no. I mean, stuffed animal does. You know. I don't know why. <laughs> nice. Oh, that is too funny. So do you think that um, with your friend, that, that really puts you on a path um, with, with like Lyme later on that you came back to it? Oh, your friend that – Yeah, I mean, as school? soon as I – I went to, you know, I, I then moved to Vermont for residency right. at this amazing right. clinic that I still work at, mm -hmm. Sojourns Community Health Clinic. Um, and so um, I knew that I wanted to do this, but I knew I needed more training. And so I started reading Stephen Buhner's work. You probably mm -hmm. know, herbalist, oh, yeah. amazing uh, oh, yeah. researcher and herbalist compiling all this information. So I learned so much through that. And then um, another friend, uh, who's one of my study buddies, um, had done a, uh, an internship with Dr. Horowitz, who actually wrote the forward, um, Richard Horowitz, mm -hmm. yeah. who's um, brilliant, incredible, and very holistic, too. So I did an internship with him, and so that gave me the um, you know, more MD kind of evidence-based, research-based, um, pharma pharmaceutical yeah. learning, because I, I prescribe medications uh, in Vermont as a naturopath. So I use pharmaceuticals and then, um, you know, he also does some herbals, but he comes from that MD world. So yeah. that was just incredible. I remember all the studying I was doing in between my sessions with him <laughs> and how much I learned and just, you know, pouring over that material. So that was, that was amazing. And then, um, you know, basically Stephen Buhner's work and some other, some other books along the way. And, um, yeah, diving in that first year with yeah. treating Lyme disease. And I had no idea that it was really just arriving in Vermont and mm -hmm. New England in a big way. Because then, yeah. what was it, like 2015, Vermont became number one in the country for mm -hmm. incidence of Lyme disease. Um, so, you know, people, I was seeing people um, 2010, 2012, you know, I said, oh, there's no, you know, my doctor says there's no Lyme here. I've had people tell me there are no ticks here. Like, okay. Oh, okay. Seriously. <laughs> you know, that's, that's beyond ridiculous. So um, people have had a, a really hard time, I think, um, adjusting to the um, consciousness raising that we need to do around mm -hmm. the fact that, yes, Lyme is here. It's been here for a long time now. Yes. Well, more importantly, ticks are there too. Yeah. And yes. <laughs> yeah. And they're, they're kind of all over the world. I'm, I'm not sure that there's really anywhere that doesn't have ticks. Perhaps maybe the polar ice caps. Maybe. <laughs> Deserts. <laughs> it's very, very dry. Yeah. They don't like that. No, they don't. But honestly, yeah, there's probably the desert probably has something similar that you got to watch out for, I would bet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
So if people are not in the Vermont area and they need to find a doctor or uh, they're concerned about Lyme, they think they may have it or they, you know, are hunters or fishers or wild crafters or whatever brings them into the field or into the tick area during tick season often enough that they want to know that they can call on a professional if they suspect they have it. What are the, the things that you would suggest they look for in terms of qualifications or, you know, what would, if I'm in a Google search, you know, doctors in my area who do Lyme, you know, that's probably mm. going to bring up a lot of people. How would mm-hmm. you, how would you narrow it? Yeah, well, some really good resources are ILADS, the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society. And I have these resources in the book. Yeah. Um, so you can um, you can email them and they will give you a list according to your geography of Lyme literate uh, oh, nice. providers. Nice. Um, which could include, uh, you know, MDs, naturopaths. Um, counselors even you know nice. um, but these are all these are all members of ILADS um, so ILADS has a, a physician training program um, we have conferences every year I'm actually on the board uh, this year um, so you know we, we do a lot to educate practitioners about the way we think about yeah. Lyme you know about all the literature that does exist to show that Lyme and other tick-borne diseases can persist beyond that initial acute phase uh, and that uh, there's you know unfortunately that pharmaceutical antibiotics do not always work um, and that there are many alternatives many herbs and such um, that thank goodness there's more research growing on that um, that that is available um, yeah so that's a, that's one resource a global Lyme Alliance is another resource Lyme disease.org um, yeah, but um, I mean, depending on the type of provider you're looking for, I mean, I think if you're looking for a doctor or nurse practitioner, that sort of person who's going to be um, testing and maybe you know doing some some more focused treatment, then those are going to be <clears throat> very important resources. Um, but there are so many people out there that may not be associated with those mm-hmm. um, organizations as well, and I think. You know, just asking some smart questions will will certainly help um, to find other supports like herbalists, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I was going to say, what are some other potential people that one might want on their healing team if they if you do find out that you've got Lyme or any of the other tick-borne diseases? What are some potential fields that you might want to look at? Mm. Well, I think you know, someone like a counselor is important. Mm-hmm. Um, often going through any chronic illness, that's going to be important. Um, who else? I mean, having a primary care yeah. person, you know, to do that type of work, that's always really important. Um, yeah, herbalist uh, or naturopath or functional medicine doctor, you know, people that are going to look at the whole person, yeah. I think that's really important. A lot of times, you know, I refer a lot to physical therapy okay. and chiropractic, um, because a lot of people are dealing with joint issues and body pain. Um, so that can be very, very helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, at Sojourns, we have, it's an integrative practice. So we have these yeah. practitioners uh, available, which is great. Um, yeah, the list can go on. Nutritionist, yeah. <laughs> uh, because diet is so important and I can dive into that a little bit. Um, but, you know, we're usually talking a lot about the treatment plan mm-hmm. and all these other pieces. So um to go deeper into nutrition, I usually um, refer for that as well. Yeah, that makes sense. So many pieces, yeah. absolutely. It takes, it takes a, a nice um, group of folks to, to support, support you on this journey a lot of the time, yeah. Yeah. All right. So how can people get a hold of you? Um, well, so I'm at Sojourns Community Health Clinic full-time, and that's sojourns.org. Okay. Um, but my website is dralexischesney.com, and I do have a private office as well, so I do um, work out of Northampton, Mass, a little bit, very small, um, and then I do phone consults and speaking um, and that sort of thing, so then the, my website would be the place to go, okay. um, and then if you're interested in a signed copy of the book, that would be at dralexischesney.com, 
or you could go directly to dralexischesney.square.site. I also have a webinar on there because um, I did a, a book launch by webinar. <laughs> Since unfortunately during these times, my my in-person book launch right. <laughs> party and I had all these events and I always do a lot of public speaking locally yeah. at libraries for people mm -hmm. every year. Mm -hmm. So all that was canceled. So I did a, a 90 minute um, PowerPoint and presentation for people. Um, it can also be yes. found at that dralexischesney.square.site. Okay. Totally. And we will make sure all those links are on the show notes as well. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have, um, are you on the socials, Facebook at all? Or are you in any of those places? No, I'm not really. Um, okay. I'm on LinkedIn. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm not, I'm not on Facebook. <laughs> I'm not up with the times. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, Alrighty. I'm a marketing person, so we should talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm busy. I'm very busy. So I can't imagine <laughs> keeping up Facebook yeah. right now. I mean, like <laughs> I understand. I understand. Totally. Totally. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you so very much for being here. All right. Thank you for having me. It's been great. And as, as always, always, put, put an, an herb on it. it. The statements made about herbs and products on this podcast have not been evaluated by the United States Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. All information provided on this podcast or any affiliated websites is for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for advice from your physician or other healthcare professional. You should not use the information on this podcast and its affiliated websites for a diagnosis or treatment of any health problem. Always consult with a healthcare professional before starting any new vitamins, supplements, diet, or exercise program before taking any medication or if you have or suspect you might have a health problem. Any testimonials, questions, or case studies are based on individual results and do not constitute a guarantee that you will achieve the same results.